السيشن اللي جايه ان شاء الله هتكون مع باشمهندس اسلام الشافعي مايكروسوفت وهيكلمنا عن مدى تاثير التحول الرقمي على الشركات في تغيير معايير واستراتيجيات الامن المعلومات. اتفضل معايا. اوكي تمام. آه، السلام عليكم انا اسلام الشافعي. آه، انا مسؤول عن السكيورتي والكومبلاينس في مايكروسوفت الشرق واسطو افريقيا. آه، كل ما هو متعلق بالبنوك المركزيه الفاينانشال سيكتور عموما ال ال الجهات المتعلقه بالريجليشنز بتاعه التلكوز وهكذا وال... واي اورجانيزيشن بتشتغل على سكيورتي استراتيجي طيب انا حابب ابدا البرزنتيشن بشويه اسئله بتسمحوا لي نكمل الانجليش يعني what percentage of executives believe they are fully prepared for today's cyber security threats السيشن اللي فاتت Uh, my colleague talked a lot about how cyber th security threats are getting uh, more sophisticated. So how, how much do you think are really prepared today? 21%. 21% is a scary figure, right? Because most of the organizations today are investing in prevention technologies. The strategy of which components I should invest in first, which components should be prioritized, This is exactly the right answer for today's uh, landscape. <clears throat> My second question is, what percentage of executives have been able to fully fund? So even those who have the, sec the security strategy in place, who knows exactly what they're supposed to do, which are quite few, but even with those, do they have the funds, the budget, to be able to invest such projects? like to invest in detection and prevention and response to have the right strategy in place. How, how much would be the figure, do you think? Any idea? Less than 25. Less than 25% have the budgets for their, strate their security strategy investments. Another good question is how many executives admit their company does not even have an end-to-end -end security strategy, right? Because deploying security components does not necessarily mean that you have is a, a, a matured, well-defined security strategy. Everyone will have email security, right? Everyone will have antivirus engines on the endpoint and on the servers, fine. But do, do they really have, how much percent that really have the end-to-end <coughs> -end security strategy? One out of three admit that they don't have it. So instead of, uh, when I thought what, what, uh, what should I speak today about, I thought to, to actually relate to digital transformation, to how cybersecurity is a main building block in any organization's digital transformation. When, you know, the word digital transformation has been a little bit abused for maybe for the current few years. But really think about it this way. Anyone trying to transform their business using technology for the sake of uh, reducing their costs and increasing their revenue. As simple as this, right? So cybersecurity should not be considered as an IT job. It is implemented by IT at some point when it comes to projects and implementations and integrations and the technology itself, right? But it is not an IT thing only. It is a shared responsibility between the whole business stakeholders. It's very related to the risk and compliance. Because at the end of the day, if, for example, a, a teleco, like Vodafone and Mobinil telecos in Egypt here, if they're not compliant, if they're not compliant with what NTRA is asking them for, which is the, the, the regulatory for if they're not compliant with what NTRA is asking for, then they still have a problem. So it's not just about deploying components here and there for security. <clears throat> and to be able to cater for the, the increased and the more sophisticated threat landscape that my colleague mentioned in the last session, right? It's huge. How to do that? There, there should be a mind shift. The way we think, the way we plan for deploying components, we should uh, take a step back and have a mind shift, change the way we think, the way we prioritize which components we should start with, define a whole strategy that is really based, uh, that is really based on, what and on how we can protect against those modern threats, not again just deploying different components here and there. 
I will touch base then on some modern strategies that's related to threat protection, so how we can do threat protection in a way that cater for this challenging error. Then we will touch base on a very important topic, and I see it one of the most challenging when it comes to, to defining your strategy, is how to measure my success in security. So I can say, for example, I'm an organization, I have all the budgets, I'm, I'm planning to invest X amount of dollars this year in security components, right? But at the end of the day, I'm a business, and I need to show my success, like to measure my, my, my return of investment, right? When, 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 for example, some organizations go and purchase a business application, they know for sure that this business application will reduce costs, for example, related to a business process, or will increase their, their, their customer satisfaction, so they can really measure the return of investment. In security, it's really tricky, because at the end of the day, it depends on many variables that I don't know. One of these variables is simply, am I getting attacked or not? Maybe I'm not attacked yet. So are these investments then not necessary? So this is really a very good question, right? Finally, I will touch base on our approach as Microsoft when it comes to security. How we really think uh, that, uh, how we really think that the approach to security should be, and most importantly, what are the areas that we touch and we protect, and how integrated are our solutions. So, digital transformation is the fourth industrial revolution, right? It started with uh, the steam and water, and then electricity, the second revolution, and then the electronics. Now, everyone is transforming their business. It's not, it's not anymore about the, the tech companies, right, or the telecos, or those sophisticated organizations. Any business now have to have ways to, to be able to reach their customers digitally, to be able to, to measure the, their customer satisfaction in the digital world, right? So it's happening everywhere, and it's fueled by new technologies, right? Because even your customer is enforcing you to adopt these technologies. When your customer is talking about your product on a social media platform, you have to have the ways to measure their satisfaction, right? And it's very relevant to every industry, as I mentioned. And digital masters perform better. Those who knows how to use the, today's tools have much better performance and productivity. Finally, it's the, the number one priority for 86% of CEOs as of today. So your, your top your top four opportunities for digital transformation starts with the new technologies, right? Where you have to provide personalized experiences to your customers, maybe draw some uh, uh, actionable insights, but wait. While doing that, you need to make sure that you're protecting your customer data, right? Because it's now exposed. The second, the second opportunity that you have with your digital transformation is to empower your employees, right? So instead of having manual processes, it's better to provide them the, the tools that can increase their productivity, that can help them collaborate in a, better, in a better fashion, right? While doing that, you need to make sure that you're protecting the people and the data, right? The productive workplace is an amazing thing to, ha to have, but if it's not secure enough, then you still have an issue. The third opportunity that I believe is really important and touches on the business is optimizing your operations, right? Because at the end of the day, this will help you lower your cost and will help you achieve more. But the question is, how can you do that? You need to have secure, intelligent processes and accelerate responsiveness when it comes to the way you operate. And finally, transforming your products. So for example, different organizations take advantage of technology and the huge amount of data that they have in order to foresight new business or new revenue models, right? So statistics, analytics is really important. Again, while doing this, you need to make sure that you're protecting your product IP. That clear, right? Okay. So while doing these things, while having the, uh, this huge, amazing opportunity, $100 trillion opportunity for society and industry over the coming 10 years, there is a big threat. 52% of these companies that were part of the Fortune 500 since 2000 are gone. 
cybersecurity is one of, is, is one of the most pressing issues among these the reasons that these companies are gone. So we mentioned that we need to have a mind shift. We need to change the way we're planning. We need to change our strategy when it comes to security, right? I believe one of, one of the first and, more, and most important objectives should be to have visibility and control over the blind spots that, sh that are there in our environments, right? So instead of, instead of the mindset of fencing the firewalls, which is important, I'm not saying you don't need it, but the whole concept of fencing, the whole concept of focusing only on the network protection with the, the many known tools out there that are really good, we have to change this mindset to include other components that I believe became even more important in today's uh, landscape compared to the network. Identity. Identity now is a key component that you need to make sure that it is protected because there are many scenarios where attackers can take advantage of your identity, steal your identity, then compromise your data without even being inside your network. A very simple, straightforward example is if you're using a cloud service, a software as a service like Office 365 or Salesforce.com, whatever the, the tool is, right? If I can steal your credentials, I can simply access your confidential data without even being inside your network. This means one thing, that all the investments the, the, and the components that you have deployed in, in, uh, on, in your data center on-premise are not really helping, right? Because I'm, I'm, I'm simply getting your data from the cloud. So this is one of the most important things. Second thing is to have automated policy monitoring and enforcement to be able to simply uh, have actionable insights. So for example, if I know that one of my end users, who's a business user, uh, got his credentials stolen, I should have an automated, uh, uh, I, should, I should have an automated way to go and enforce a password, a self-service uh, password reset on this specific user. I should not wait till the user come and tell me, I think my credentials are stolen, because in many cases, they will not know. In many cases, it will take up to 140 days before knowing that someone has compromised your environment, they are already inside, they are doing reconnaissance and doing this and doing that without you knowing. So this kind of actionable insights are really important. The second thing is to have an agile and efficient threat protection where you deploy automated and integrated tool sets for response. So many of the organizations does not give response the right weight. Response is really an, an important phase when it comes to threat protection. Many organizations focus on the prevention layer, right? Where they deploy the best email security, the best antivirus, the best firewall. But what, what happened if they got attacked? We, uh, they, there should be an assume breach mentality. I should, not, I, I should never assume that I will never get attacked because simply I have the best email security or whatever. No, it should not be the case. So having the response is really important and having an automated and integrated response to the different components because you don't really know where the attack have reached. You should have response tools that are integrated with the different components that you have in your data center. One of, one of the main and, and uh, one of the main and most important components today is to be able to take advantage of telemetry, right? Because every other security component that you might have, like an email security or antivirus or whatever, or firewall, they will, will have its own threat information, right? It will tell you that uh, this user has, uh, 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 has been sent an email that was malicious, that we stopped, which is a good information, right? But it lives in the email security. And then the endpoint security tells you stuff that is similar on the endpoint level, and then you get the same from your IPS maybe, or from your, or from your IDS. All of these threat information are good, but they are not really related, they are not really connected, although they should be connected. So having the tool to connect the dots for you, to be able to tell you the full story, what happened. I remember one of our customers in the Gulf region, which is a financial sector institution, were attacked almost a year ago, right? And these people did not even know that there is an attack until the data, 
their, their confidential data was exposed uh, and they were asked for a ransom so that the rest of the data will not be published on the internet, right? I remember these people mentioned one very, uh, very interesting fact, is that they had the best email security, XYZ solution, and they did not see it coming, right? When our consultants engaged with them, trying to figure out what happened, we figured out that it started with an email, a socially engineered email, crafted in a way that looks amazingly familiar to one of the C-levels, a guy who was 50-something years old, who is in the business, business executive, he received an email that is crafted to look like it's coming from his kid's school. So the guy reacted in a very normal way. He clicked the link there, and this is how the attack started. So first, first of all, where is the detection? They might have the best email security solution, but there was no... Uh, uh, there, there was no, the right detection was not in place. And finally, the response. To achieve that, you have to connect the dots, as I mentioned, and you have to, to, to take advantage of different organizations' experiences. How can I do that? We have Microsoft, for example, we have what we call our Microsoft Intelligence Security Graph, which is simply a consolidation of all of the threats the behaviors, the experience that we have seen across every single one of our users worldwide. Imagine, billions of machines have Windows already uh, deployed on it and doing updates. Gathering these information, these experiences, and consolidating these experiences, and then taking advantage of these experiences to compare what's happening to you today to what has happened to billions of different users is definitely a big value and will help you with the right decision to move forward if you are attacked. Finally, the data. Well, the concept of protecting the data has been there since ever, right? But the main challenge is with today's uh, 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 threat, uh, sorry, with, with today's landscape and how businesses work, there are many legitimate scenarios where data can travel outside your organization, right? So it's not anymore about protecting the premises that host the data, which is still needed, right? But also protecting the data while it's in motion, protecting the data while it has been already sent and is in rest on one of your partner's machine, right? So it's all about protecting the data itself, not protecting where the data lives. This is exactly should this one this exactly should be one of the main things to change your mindset. So classify the data while it's being created. From day one, know that this piece of information should be treated as confidential, so you will get it protected automatically, then apply the protection through the data lifecycle. This is, for example, how we can do it using our Azure Information Protection, where we can classify data once it's been created, or even it was created earlier, right? And then apply encryption on the data. So it does not really matter if this piece of information will travel outside. As long as it has the protection part of the data itself, you can still control it. You can decide today and say, you know what? I'll send the document to one of my partners, and only this person will be able to access the document and he will be able to access it for only seven days. Then his permissions will expire. You can have this kind of, of control over your data while it's technically outside your premises. Well, it has been always the, a, a sort of a trade-off, right? Where you say, okay, you know, to be able to be very secure, I will, I'll have to somehow uh, uh, have lacked productivity, or I'll have to trade off productivity, right? Because I will do security hardening, I will, I will do whitelisting, I will do this, I will do that. It should not be the case. With the current digital transformation journeys that every other organization is going through, it should be both. You should have the right security solutions, not only to make you secure, but also not to affect your productivity. It's it should not be a trade-off. Let me give you a couple of ideas, right? Biometric and virtual smart authentication. Everyone today knows this. You know the fingerprint that you have in your office, or even, even the multi-factor authentication, the tokens that the banks provide 
where or the one-time password that you receive if you're accessing your online banking. This kind of things are really important and does not really affect the productivity. <coughs> Sorry. So as the IT mind, uh, mindset has changed, where initially IT was designing for not to fail, right? Where you, you deploy DR for the main solution, for the main site, so you assume if the main site is down, the DR should be up and running in X amount of seconds or minutes or whatever. This mentality has changed. Even IT today, they design to recover quickly. So they have the assume, they have the assume downtime mindset. The same thing applies to security. Instead of having the mentality of, I'll prevent every possible attack, you should have the mentality of, I will have the prevention layer, but I will assume compromise. And I will have components that can protect me in every single phase of an attack. Not only preventions, but, on, but also detect and respond along the attack phases. So threat protection life cycle starts with the prevention, as we mentioned, detection, and finally response. The goal is simple. Increase the attacker cost, which will compromise their ROI, which will affect their ROI. If you can do that, they will simply decide not to attack you and, and, and find someone else. This is not 100%, right? If it's a targeted attack where if a specific organization is targeted, this is a different story. But the, statistically, the opportunistic attack are higher prob in, in probability to happen to any organization compared to the uh, deterministic or uh, the targeted attacks. An example, WannaCry, when WannaCry ransomware happened, there were some organizations who, were, who, were, who were not, did not have the right patching in place and others had, right? Those who had the patching were not affected, those who didn't were affected. Simply those who had the patching increased the cost attack on the attacker, so he simply decided to move to a next organization, not to waste more time and money with this specific one that was able to detect it. So the, there are really three strategic imperatives to threat pr protection. First one is pre prevent as many threats as possible, which will ruin the, uh, the attacker's ROI and will be cost effective from, uh, for you as an organization. Second thing, rapidly detect and respond. And finally, con uh, continuously apply your learnings back in the threat prevention. So when I say prevent as many threats as possible, what I, what I really mean is I should have a prevention component across the different layers in my organization. I should be able to respond to every attack, uh, to each attack phase, not only uh, uh, the front line. So email, endpoint, identity, network, all of these layers should be protected by, preve uh, by prevention components because simply these components are cost effective and will raise the attacker's ROI dramatically. Still, I should have the assume breach. I should always assume that maybe something will happen, right? So take advantage of TPM hardware assurance because it has been seen in many attacks that attackers take advantage of the hardware layer itself so this is one of the things, adopt containment strategies. Maybe network containment is, is something very common to every other organization, but containment should also be on the host level and identity level. Have a clear process to tell you what you're supposed to do if this endpoint is attacked. How you should contain this endpoint. And finally, integrate context and intelligence. Take your threat information, correlate it with the other organization's experiences. This is what we can do, for example, in our threat intelligence solution. So increasing the attacker's cost should happen on every single phase. For example, on the data level, in, in SQL Server, we have different tools and components that can help us apply protection 
on the database level, including data masking and column encryption, right? On a software as a service level, which is really tricky because it lives outside your organization, right? You should have the right tools, intelligent tools that can help you do discovery for the application usage, be able to determine or identify abnormalities. If one of your users is using salesforce.com in a manner that does not make sense, you should be able to do that. If one of your users is logging into salesforce.com from China, while you don't have any business in China, it means that there's something wrong. This is an abnormality, right? Finally, have the way to uh, assess the application risks that your end users might be using. From productivity protection, you should have the, 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 the protection embedded part of the productivity solution. So for example, email. You should have email protection on the time of the user click on a link in an email body, or maybe multiple uh, antivirus engines, or attachment detonation, where you can do behavioral analysis for attachments that is coming to you over email that your antivirus engines initially thought that it is safe. The second imperative that we mentioned was to rapidly detect and respond, which is which should be integrated to the attacker's decision cycle. So every attacker starts with observing, right? They observe, they try to understand your environment, they run some scans here and there, then they start to orient. By orient, I mean they start to consider what are the options that they have to start attacking you. Then they decide on one specific option that makes sense to them, and finally, they start the execution. As a defender, your decision cycle should be integrated to this and should not only be after the fact, which in many cases happens, no, but it, also, it should also be proactive, where you should be able to detect the kind of, uh, the, this kind of attack before the act happens. Finally, we mentioned that, uh, I mentioned earlier in, in, the, in the agenda uh, that I'll talk about how to measure my security success. So any return of investment simply means there is, a, there, is, there is a return and there's an investment. As a defender, your investment is simply your security budget, the money that you're spending to get security components and services, right? And the time and team attention, right? The return should always, as we mentioned, is to ruin the attacker return of investment which will uh, deter opportunistic attacks and slow or stops determined attacks. The attacker himself has a return of investment. His return is to have as much successful attacks as possible, and their investment is the cost of attack. The, the investments that they did in order to be able to, to, to get the vulnerability out there, the tools that they're using, the hardware, resources, whatever, whatever investments they're doing to have an attack successful. Ruining the attacker ROI is the right mindset. So it's all about breaking the known attack uh, playbook, then having the right agile response and recovery. This will definitely ruin the attacker's ec economic model. And if you still, if you're done with those first two components, you can then start working on eliminating other attack vectors, like the zero-day attack kind of things, but those are really more important to start with. Our approach as Microsoft is really is simply composed of three main pillars. We have the platform that every one of you knows about it, different components on, on different layers across from end to end, right? Those are security components or even parts of some platforms. So this is one of the things. The intelligence that we use, which is really important, which I believe differentiates us big time, which is based on our experiences and our footprint. We have more than 200 global cloud co and consumer and commercial services, right? Think about it this way. How many years have we had Outlook and, and, uh, and Hotmail and, and this, these kind of cloud services? The learnings and the experiences that we have uh, that we have acquired from these services are consolidated, as I mentioned, part of our intelligent security graph. Consider also the 1 billion Windows devices getting updated worldwide, 300 billion monthly authentication happens in our Azure data centers, and finally, 18 plus billion Bing web pages get scammed. This huge intelligence, we're taking advantage of it, and we're offering our customers to do the same thing. We integrate our security solutions to these intelligence to provide you with the right decision while uh, securing your environment. The second 
pillar is how we, how we have partnerships with most of the big security vendors out there, which we believe that no one has the single version of truth, right? I cannot assume that I have the single version of truth of every single aspect of security. So it's really good to share th threat intelligence. For example, our endpoint uh, e uh, endpoint detect and response solution, Windows Defender Advanced Threat Protection, takes advantage of our threats and other threats from other vendors that were happy to do that, right? Because at the end of the day, this is for the sake of the customer. So this is a quick look on the names of the partners, and those are the entities that we work for, including Cloud Security Alliance, ISO, and many others. Our unique approach is we have solutions that, that are across four different layers, start with the identity, device, applications, and data, and finally, infrastructure. Thank you so much. Uh, I hope the session was, was beneficial. We'll see you tomorrow in the Cloud Access Security Broker session. Thank you.